The Polk County Sheriff's Office works hard to keep residents safe, but the fact is there might come a time when you have to run, hide, or fight as a response to an active shooter scenario on your college campus. Active shooter situations are unpredictable and evolve quickly, so it's important to have a plan of action and to be aware of your surroundings as much as possible. Over the course of this episode of The Buzz, Lieutenant Ryan Shea and Sergeant Craig Powers from the Polk County Sheriff's Office are training us on how to be prepared for an active shooter scenario. But it's very simple. If you have an opportunity to escape through an exit and you're close by, you should do nothing else other than that. Get out of there. We're trying to get as many people away from the situation as possible. You know, you could have the best security measures in the world, but I don't know that you could ever prevent one of these uh, events from happening. If someone is intent on doing something, just like uh, Lieutenant Shea kind of described these three individuals that did this, if they really want to do this and they've planned and trained it out, they're going to get, find a way to get there. The best that we can hope for is to try to mitigate what happens after they start the event and trying to get as many people away from there as possible if the opportunity exists is what we're after right off the bat. With that said, when you're doing that, obviously, as you're going out, you warn other people, don't go in there. Somebody killing a bunch of people, you know. Don't tell, you know, tell everybody else, don't go in there. Have an escape route and plan in mind. Okay, so how many of you ever go to a new restaurant or a place or a store and you look for those exit signs because they're in every single building by law, right? Looking it out when you go to a restaurant, all right? Something happens in here, even a robbery or something. How am I going to get out of here? How am I going to get out of the way? Fire, you know? Having an escape route already in mind, especially if you go to the same place every day, whether it be a school, um, you know, you, you, if you're going to the same church all the time, you know, where, how are you going to get out of there if something happens in this particular area? You need to have that already in your mind so you're not trying to figure this stuff out while there's gunshots and screaming going on. You're not going to be able to think fast enough. So having that preset in your mind is what you'd look for. You're going to have to evacuate regardless if others agree to follow. So you're, you're all, there's, two, there's two sides of that coin. There's going to be people around you, no matter where you're at, that may have some physical cap, uh, limitations or whatever. So don't only think of yourself. You need to try to help others get out as possible. Hey, come on, we've got to go. But there will be a group of people or a percentage of people when induced with you know, extreme fear or stress that will just freak out and freeze. And they'll just be sitting there you know, with that OMG look on their face. Is this really happening? You know, hey, come on, we've got to go. But if they sit there and, and, and just freeze up, you're going to have to get out of there. If you remain behind, you just might as well count yourself as potentially one of the victims, okay? So you try to help as many as you can, but if someone is just in a frozen state, get out of there anyway. Hopefully they'll figure it out. Leave your belongings behind. Now, if you've got it right next to you, obviously you're going you're to go with you, but don't go two doors down to grab your briefcase, your purse, your backpack, school books, get out of there. There's no statistics where the active shooter rummaged through someone's purse on the way of killing people. It just doesn't happen. They're not going to look in, in your cell phone or grab your personal belongings. They're there to kill people. Help others escape. Keep your hands visible. That's helpful to us. As you're running out, and remember, we're running in. And we're trying to process who's, who might be the bad person here, who's doing all this crime. But if you've if you got your hands up, that's easy for us to figure out that you're not, you, know, you don't have a gun in your hand getting ready to kill more people. So we're going to try to get to that person. And don't drop your cell phone away. If you do, don't pick it up. Keep going. <laughs> Follow the instructions of any police officers. Don't, you know, hey, well, I think I should go this way. If they tell you go behind them, just keep in that direction. Listen to them and, and follow their direction. Don't attempt to move wounded people. Do not attempt to move wounded people. Okay, that's a personal decision that you're going to have to make. But why are we telling you that as a, as a concept? If someone has been shot and you're on your way out and they're in the middle of the floor and you and another person spend an additional two or three minutes trying to help that person up, and they're, you know, they're dead weight at that point, they're just, you know, they're sagging, they may not be able to help themselves, understand that two more people may lose their life. Okay, that's a hard decision, and that's something you'd have to internalize and decide on your own. And you may say, the way I was brought up, my religious beliefs, I'm going to try to help this person, even if it means potentially dying. But just understand, the more people that stop and try to help the wounded initially, the numbers are going to continue to rise of the people that are, are being killed during the event, okay? When you get to a safe place, 
or wherever that be, into hiding, which we'll discuss in the next slide, or outside, try to get on your phone and dial 911 and update the operator dispatcher with the information that you might have regarding the shooter, if you have it. If you don't have any information, don't call 911. Just say, I, I was able to get out of the building and I have nothing else to offer. They understand that somebody else is going to have more important information. But if you saw the shooter down the hallway or something like that, um, you would call in and give that information if you have it. All right, so if hiding is not, if evacuating is not an option, maybe you realize if I try to get out, I'm going to have to go past the shooter or I'm just kind of boxed in. Um, the next option is uh, hiding. With that said, you're obviously looking for a place that you could potentially lock the door. That would be best circumstances. However, you know, you don't want to run down a hallway thinking that, well, if I could just get to this closet down there, I know it's lockable, but you can get to another area, um, get in there and get in a safe place. Because the second tenant is probably as equally important as the first. Even if you can get to a locked door, you need to barricade that door with something behind it if you have that opportunity. You stack stuff against the door, um, anything that you can to prevent the person from trying to push the door open easily. Again, let's go back to how the description and definition of an active shooter, right? They're lazy. It's the, the only thought pattern they want is to point a gun and pull the trigger. There's nowhere in the statistics where they brought a battle axe with them and they laid their gun down and tried to chop a door down just to see if they could get on the other side and kill some people. That's not the way they function. If they get to a doorway and they have to do a lot of fuss with it, they're going to continue on. Hopefully, they, the next door, next classroom down there, they can kill more people. Okay? So barricade that door with shelves, desks, tables, anything that you can to shove in front of the door. That's what we're looking for. Okay? Get away from windows. Cl cover them. Close them. Blinds. Whatever you got. Curtains. If you have that opportunity, immediately try to get that done. Shut the lights off. Get away from the windows just in case they're shooting wildly. You don't want a bullet to just come through there and arbitrarily hit you. But you're trying to make it look like take no, you, know, they don't, you don't want the shooter to take notice of that area. So if the blinds are closed, the lights are off, they may assume that no one's in that room. And why would they waste time to try to go in there? And hopefully they'll go down the hallway and look for some other place to shoot people. Okay, find a closest uh, location to hide in. Uh, cover versus concealment. So, as a sniper, a bush for me could be concealment, right? Someone couldn't see me. But if someone shot in that bush, it's not going to stop a bullet. So, cover would be behind an oak tree. You know, an oak tree or something with thickness could potentially stop a small bullet like a, a pistol. So, you're looking for the best thing is something can, that can seal you and also provide cover. In other words, a bullet may not go through it. Desks, chairs, anything that could, a bullet would have to pass through um, before it hits you, anything that you can get behind. Because even if it's just plastic, when a bullet hits something, it's going to destro start destroying that bullet and tearing it up. So if it does make it through and hit you, it may not, it's not going to be as bad as just a straight bullet uh, dead on. Okay, at some point, whether you're on the phone in 911 or you're in hiding, you're going to put that phone to silent and try to be quiet. That's not the time in hiding to start updating your Facebook page, folks. You know, updating your status. I'm in bad shape here. That's not the time, but you eventually got to shut that phone down and hopefully you don't be talking. Even if you're on 911, you eventually got to say, hey, I've got to stop talking. I think he's right outside the door. You do not want to draw attention to the area that you're trying to hide in. Okay? Here's another rough one, just like not moving wounded people. If you're inside that door and you've already barricaded that door, someone else might have been in the restroom and on the way back to the classroom or wherever you're hiding and saying, let me in. You don't want to take that, especially if you've got five or six people. Again, you don't want to risk the numbers over one person. And that sounds kind of callous. And again, that's a, de a decision that you may have to make. But understand, if you open that door and the active shooter is right next door, you know, close by, he may make it into that room as well. And all of you could potentially lose your life. So think about that, and, and, and especially ahead of time. And what would you do in that particular situation? Next slide, please. All right, worst case scenario, we, you know, obviously you're going to try to evacuate first. If that's not available, you're going to try to hide. But you may be in a position where when this thing starts, you're not going to have time to run and hide, and you may not have time to evacuate. You may be confronted with that act. Somebody eventually is going to get confronted with the active shooter because they're shooting people, right? There'll be one person that will see them first, and that may be you. What you do at that point is crucial. This is your last option. This is to live. You can stand there. And take it like a man or a woman, 
and take your chances and see if you die or not, or you can actually do something about it, uh, and that's fight back. This is where uh, the most crucial point of what we all need to do as citizens around the, this country, and we're starting to do it. You see it on the airplane during 9-11 attacks. They finally, it took them a while to get in the, in the gear, but they finally said, we're going to make an attack on this person. They waited a little bit too long, and that plane went down the field in Pennsylvania anyway. But they eventually said, we've got to do this. Let's roll. And they went up there. Can you imagine if they'd done that maybe 20 minutes before and took that chance? When your life's confronted, you're going to have to do something immediately. When you do it, you're going to fight back. You're going to be an aggressive. Now, I wear a gun every day. But I can tell you, and you listen, my family will tell you, I'm not an aggressive person. I'm pretty laid back. Nothing rattles me that much. I've been in the military for 27 years. I've got four combat tours. I'm pretty level. It takes a while for me to get elevated up. But I can tell you right now, if, if I have to save your life or somebody else's or my own in the field as a law enforcement officer, I'll flip a switch. And I'll go to work and I'll prevent, I'll do it, I'll use this gun where it's meant to. Other than that, I have no desire to hurt anybody. I, I've never had to shoot it at anybody with this gun. But I can tell you right now, if I have to, I will flip that switch and I'll do what is required of me, especially as a sniper. Same thing. Most of my job is just to observe things and feedback to the commander. But I know one day there may be a chance where somebody's doing something that they're going to hurt somebody and I may have to, to shoot that person. I don't want to, but I will if I have to. That's the place that you're going to need to go at this point because we're all average just citizens. We don't think about every day, what if I have to attack somebody who's trying to attack me? But you need to internalize and think about it ahead of time. What would I do in that situation? Um, many of you may have uh, other sisters and brothers or family members, and some of you here are old enough to even have kids. If someone were to harm your child, or for those of you that are fairly young, if someone were to hurt your mother right in front of you, what would you do to that person? You would protect your mother, or you would protect your child, or your, your siblings, your family members at all costs probably, wouldn't you? That's the place that you've got to go right here. It's life or death. It's win or lose. Losing means you're not here no more. Your family's going to be without you. We don't have it up here, but statistically, on those FBI statistics that I showed you, there's been a great percentage. Those who fought back were able to stop that assailant, that shooter, before law enforcement arrived. How many of you remember a few years ago, some of y'all are fairly young, but over in Arizona, there was a congresswoman, Giffords, that was holding a political rally in a, in a supermarket parking lot. And the guy went in there and started shooting people. Yeah, he killed a few people, but they jumped on him. They had no weapons, and they jumped on him and held him down until the police got there. That's just one example. There, if we, there's plenty of case studies that we could show you where, statistically, if you fight back, you can win in these situations. But you've got to act aggressively. You've got to go after that person. You've got to commit to your actions. The more people that are able to jump on that person immediately, the better it's going to be. Um, Ryan and I went to a class where we practiced that. We had a little paint bullets or the plastic BBs and we had the person said when you get ready start shooting people and all the rest of you I want you to run at him even though he's going to bring a gun up start shooting at you jump on him and grab him and we did that and that person never hit anybody that's the way it could wind up with real bullets we were well, half the class jumped on this guy and held him held him down yelling aggressively you got to throw items you if you're close by no matter what it is bottle of water, a pencil, a pen, a stapler, whatever you can get. Yeah. I mean, this little item right here, the clicker, that's changed the slides. How much physical damage could this instrument do if I threw it at this young man right here? Physically. Not much, right? But I guarantee if I stood back like there and wound up like a baseball player and threw it at him, what do you think his, his natural reaction would be? He's probably going to do something like that, right? Maybe you deflect it. Um, it's, it, even though he knows it's not going to cause that much damage. The people that are shooting people are, are human, just like we all are. You, your body just reacts to certain things uh, without you thinking about it. And the natural reaction for someone who's being yelled at or something thrown at them is to kind of wince or, or pull back. That might be the last bullet in the gun, fired into the floor, fired into the ceiling, or fired at some, something else. So you're yelling, trying to get their attention off of doing this, to something else, distract them, that last bullet being fired and aiming and firing, you're just trying to do something, interrupt that, uh, that pattern. And throwing something may be, um, you know, what it takes to prevent them from shooting at another person. You gotta commit to your actions, go back real quick, because your life depends on it. 
Okay? Once you start, you don't walk up and just smack them in the face. So that's not going to work. You're just going to tick them off. You know, you got to commit to it and go for it. After the break, we'll have more from Lieutenant Shea and Sergeant Powers. Stay tuned. You're watching The Buzz on PGTV. If you store your guns properly, I'll feel safer when I'm playing outside. Safer when walking home. I won't have to tell so many family members. I'm sorry. I won't hear as many scary stories. And I won't have to tell my kids. This isn't a drill. Please. Please, do it for us. Your family, friends, and neighbors are all counting on you. Never let your gun get into the wrong hands. Remember, always lock it up. Visit ncpc.org. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. a scorcher outside today, we're seeing record-breaking temperatures across the Sunshine State, and heat advisories are in effect. While Florida is a perfect place to catch some sun and waves, remember, protect yourself and family members by staying cool during these summer months. While exercising, doing yard work, or splashing in the pool, reduce or eliminate strenuous activity outside or reschedule to the coolest time of the day. Wear lightweight, light-colored, loose-fitting clothing. Drink plenty of water even if you don't feel thirsty. Wear sunglasses that block UV rays. Be sure to watch for these symptoms. And for more ways to beat the heat, visit our website. Uh, most schools uh, have seen this terminology here, Alice, alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and evacuate. Very similar to run, hide, fight, just thrown in a different, in a, thrown in an acronym. So alert means anything that you can use to alert as many people as possible. For schools, it's the intercom system or an air horn, whatever you can get a hold of that you can notify people. If something else is, something's going on around here, you're trying to do that in the alert process. Lockdown, excuse me, lockdown is the same thing as hide. Most schools are going to use the term lockdown, okay? I think the they changed the terminology in Polk County a little bit. It used to be a hard lockdown or a soft lockdown. They, they use a little bit different terminology, okay? Inform, using any means to, as you're on your way, you know, informing others by some fashion that this is happening, similar to the alert. Counter is the same thing as fight. Anything you can do is counter that, that person's objective of hurting you or others. And evacuate is the same thing as run that we talked about. Now, obviously, ALICE is in an order because it's an acronym, A-L-I-C. But I don't want you to leave here believing that, well, Sergeant Powers told me that I always have to run first, hide second, and fight last. That's not what we're telling you here. You're going to have to make the decision on what best, what's the best course of action based upon what's transpiring in front of you. That may mean skipping running and go right to hiding. You don't have time. It may mean that you have to fight first, you knock them down, and then you run and evacuate. Does that make sense to you? Okay, you have to make a decision, but there, you don't have to start out with one and go to the next one. It's not, it's not sequential. Okay? You have to make a decision on what's the best uh, process to use based upon what's happening at the, at the time. Next, sir. That's me. So what we want you guys to do, obviously we've given you the information on what you need to do. But when you get to that safe location, whether you've run out of the building, obviously you saw in the video, we want you to get further away from the building. Or if you get stuck inside of a room and you have to hide or barricade, you can leave your phone on, allow the 911 operator to listen in to what's going on, especially if the shooter's nearby. We can hear those gunshots going off. You might be able to give that 911 operator some good information and intel that will lead us to where the shooter is. So these are pretty much the easiest things that we can tell you that we need from you. If you call 911 and you're giving information, and we know that we're going to get inundated with a lot of phone calls, but you might be that one person that makes that call that has the information. 
Don't just think somebody else is going to make that call. If you have that ability, make the phone call. We need to know the location of the shooter. If you know where you last saw the shooter, then call in and say, this is where I last saw the shooter. Because we, that could give us a timeline. If somebody else then calls us, that means they're moving further into the building or they're moving away from the building. Call us and let us know what information you have. The number of shooters, if there's more than one. Physical description of the shooters, obviously what you remember them wearing. That could change. You know, they could wear an outer layer of clothing and then remove it throughout the process. But whatever you remember them wearing, make sure you let law enforcement know. Number and type of weapons held by the shooter. I am not interested to know, or maybe I am a little bit, because if you do know the difference, good for you. I don't need to know if you know the difference between an AK-47 and an SKS rifle. I need to know if they have a handgun or a long gun. Really simple. Really simple. Because if they have a long gun, then I'm going to respond with a long gun. If they have a handgun, then I'm going to respond with a long gun. Yeah. <laughs> okay? That's right. Real simple for me. I know what I'm bringing with me. So, but those are the important things. I don't need to know if you know the, what type of weapon it is. Just let me know handgun or long gun. And if you come across people, obviously Sergeant Powers was talking about it a little bit before. If you see people down, if you see people injured or potentially dead in this particular incident, let us know where you saw them. You may know them. If you know them by name, tell us their name and where you last saw them or where you left them. I, I don't mean to be callous. This is just, it allows us to get to these people quicker and provide them with the aid that they may need. The primary goal of law enforcement when we get there is to eliminate the threat. We have got to get to where that shooter is. I am not going to be able to stop and talk to you. I, I may stop you and get some information from you, gather some intel, but it's going to be quick. I can't have you hesitating. I can't have you crying. I need that information. If you're hesitating, you're crying. I'm moving on to somebody else that can talk to me. I need to know where that shooter is so I can stop them from killing people that you might know. It's, I'm not going to be able to stop and help injured people until the environment is safe. Officers may arrive individually or in teams with tactical equipment. Officers will need to take command of the situation. We're going to yell at you. Who's ever heard of a cop yelling at people? I mean, it's going to happen. Okay, we're going to yell at you. Maybe a little bit more aggressively in this situation because we're pretty amped up by what we're going into too. This is not something that is going to happen every day. The probability of you being involved in an active shooter incident is very slim. But the fact that it's possible that you could leave here today and go to Publix to get a sandwich, it's possible an ex-employee could walk in there and just start shooting at people. You are now armed with information that you can use to get yourself and maybe other people out of there alive. So because that possibility exists, that's why we're here to give you this information today. Craig? This is usually one of my favorite slides. If you're involved in an active shooter situation, remain calm. <laughs> yeah. Remain calm. It's, just, it's that simple. It's just like saying it. Just, you know, say it to yourself. Remain calm. It's not going to be that easy. It isn't. I mean, let's be honest. It's not. But if you are going to make that phone call to 911, we need you to be under control so we can understand what you're saying. If you do stop a law enforcement officer and want to provide them with information on maybe one of your friends that was injured, then you need to be calm and give us that information. I'm not going to have, stop, I'm not going to have time to stop and listen to you if you're not composed and able to give us that information. We want you to raise your hands high, keep your hands empty. You saw me earlier stand up behind Sergeant Powers when he was talking about it. Do not run out of the building with your cell phone in your hand. How many of us have heard of law enforcement officers shooting people with cell phones in their hands? I've heard of it. I pay attention. It happens. Don't put yourself in that situation. If I'm looking for a small black handgun and you're running out with a cell phone in your hand, these iPhone 6s are pretty big. 
let's be honest, they're pretty big. The, one I, the phone I have on my hip, there's guns that are smaller than that. Don't put yourself in that situation. Don't have anything in your hands. Nothing in your hands means you're not a threat to me. Keep moving. Do not make any quick movements or grab onto the officer. This is not the time when we are running into the building trying to stop the shooter for you to run and grab onto me and say, oh, thank goodness you're here. I love you. My wife will tell you wherever she is at this point in time, I'm a bit of a hugger. I'll hug it out with you, just not right then. We'll meet up later, all right? <laughs> Follow officer's instructions. Do not debate with us at that time. If you have information, give it to us, but this is not the time to debate with us whether or not we're gonna go into that building and you wanna come with us. We're gonna tell you to stay out, stay out. Remain at the evacuation point or safe location until cleared by law enforcement. This is a very key point. You may be in a school setting. If you may not know what the evacuation point, the evacuation point is not your car and getting in it and leaving. We need you to stay around. If you're an instructor or an administrator at your school, take your classroom to a safe location and make sure that you have all of your students that were there that particular day. Make sure you account for everybody because if you don't have somebody, then there's that possibility that exists that they could be injured or dead inside that location. God forbid. We do not want that. But if that possibility exists, or if you decide to get in your car and leave, then we've got to track you down. Don't do that. You also may have information to share with law enforcement that we need. So don't leave. The average citizen out there is not trained to respond to someone coming in and shooting at them. There's no possible way as a trainer. I've trained a bunch of cops. And I see them in a stressful situation, and I know they've been trained, and we put them in active shooter response training at the school at Lake Region. And I've watched deputies do a lot of crazy stuff that they, I know we never trained them because they're induced with fear, and they've never seen this particular situation before. And they do a lot, of, a lot of stuff that they never thought they would do and react because they, they really believe they're in it. We do paint bullet fighting. But your mind, I'm telling you right now, if you've never thought about what you would do in this situation or practiced it or had some kind of training, your mind is, your mind is not going to be able to process what's going on fast enough for you to make the best decision. Someone's put it, you're going to do something. Is that something going to be enough to help you out in that situation? Or, or will it just be conflicting with what you ought to be doing? Run, hide, and fight. Okay? So you have to think about it ahead of time what am I going to do in this situation? Come up with that kind of plan wherever you're at, and then you practice that plan. So that's what we do as cops, law enforcement officers. We practice what we're going to do in that response to uh, that motorist who's doing something. What are we going to do if this happens? We play that what-if game a lot. If I show up to the 7-Eleven or the Circle K, and if I park over here, and as I'm walking up to the store, a guy comes running out who just robbed the store, what am I going to do here? I've already got that in my mind. I kind of got a plan what's going to happen when I get up there. Or I'm responding to that hot call and I'm running lights and siren and listen to the dispatcher. I'm still coming up with my plan. All right, how am I going to approach? Where am I going to park? What am I going to do when I get up there? Are the person, are they going to come out shooting? Or are they just going to be there on the side of the road? What's going to happen? So you've got to do that up front. You've got to be somewhat prepared mentally and have trained in it or you're, gone, you're not going to be able to make the best decisions uh, that you should. That's all the time we have for today. If you want to watch this episode again, you can catch a replay on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 1 or 7 p.m. on PGTV. You can also find us on the Polk Government YouTube page. Thanks for joining me once again on this month's episode of The Buzz. I'll see you next time.